Thank you for coming out on this beginning of the last week of classes. Amazing to see so many of you here. My name is Patrice Franco, and I'm the Grossman Professor of Economics and Global Studies and the director of the Goldfarb Center. And it is my great honor to introduce you to the Mitchell 2018 Lecture in International Affairs. In a few days, the World Bank will be launching a new report on global economic mobility, focusing on the drivers, improving the status of the poor with the theme, hashtag, I love this, inherent, possi inherent possibility. This is part of a broader strategic goal of reducing poverty <coughs> and raising the income of the poorest 40% of the population in developing countries by 2030. So when Dr. Georgieva, our speaker, gets to work each day, usually at around 7.30, I read, this is her to-do list. Reduce poverty and improve mobility in just about a decade. And I wouldn't bet against her. Since 2017, Dr. Georgieva's role at the World Bank is in mobilizing the resources and institutional capacity to deliver on complex global challenges. She's charged with taking an institution of more than 10,000 people in 120 countries to become agile, collaborative, and effective. With fixed resources and waning global political will, her work involves developing new relationships with the private sector to deliver public goods. Dr. Georgieva has a reputation for delivering, delivering strategic solutions to complex problems. As co-chair of the United Nations General Secretary's high-level panel on humanitarian financing, she revisioned a much more effective system to meet the needs of record numbers of vulnerable people. As the European Commissioner Vice President for Budget and Human Resources, Georgieva managed the European Union's 161 billion euro budget, for those of you who don't do exchange rates, that's something around $175 billion, and 33,000 staff across its institutions around the world. In this capacity, she tripled funding available to the refugees in Europe. This has been a meteoric journey for a girl born behind the Iron Curtain in Sofia, Bulgaria, where she wrote her PhD on environmental protection policy and economic growth in the US. I'd still love to see that, <laughs> especially today. As East and West began to merge again, she was able to study at the LSE and at Harvard. Her ability to not only identify challenges, but also to bring different stakeholders together to mobilize institutional resources and supportive solutions has garnered worldwide respect. She has been a change agent in catalyzing humanitarian responses and adapting institutions to evolving challenges. Our Mitchell Lecture is an extraordinary opportunity to bring a globally recognized policymaker to Mayflower Hill and Colby. We hope tonight's event inspires some of the students in this room to lives of public service consistent with the examples of Senator Mitchell and Dr. Georgieva. Although being a senator and a special envoy to negotiate peace in Ireland may feel kind of glitzy, or being the, the European Union's humanitarian efforts and World Bank efforts to, toward in, inclusive prosperity may sound glamorous, they also involve a selfless commitment to others that both our speaker and our senator in body. If Senator Mitchell had been able to be here tonight, we had scheduled this for another night and then Dr. Georgieva had to, to switch the date, so he sends his regrets. But if Senator Mitchell had been able to be here tonight, students, you would have heard about his humble beginnings in Waterville, building the lawn in front of Foss. Raise your hand in this room if you've heard that before. Okay, this is the Mitchell family and the community, and this is what it means to be part of this place that helped foster people like Senator Mitchell. 
So students, please know whether you come from Waterville, Maine, or Sofia, Bulgaria, you can go out to change the world. You, we hope you take these life stories as guides for your own professional journeys. Thank you, Dr. Georgieva, for all your work, and we welcome you to Colby to share your thoughts on that small to-do list, Daring to Confront Poverty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a uh, huge honor to speak uh, in a series uh, that somebody who has contributed tremendously uh, to Europe uh, has established here in this college. And uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be with you uh, tonight. Uh, since you started with my PhD, uh, it actually brought uh, back memories. Uh, I had to select uh, my thesis in Bulgaria during the days of uh, communism. And uh, at that time, uh, we actually were required to prove the validity of the team we choose on the basis of three things. The uh, teachings of Marx, who by the way, uh, had his 200th birthday yesterday. <laughs> And I would say immediately, I have no problem with Marx. <laughs> but then we also had to uh, quote from Lenin. I had a bit of a problem with Lenin. <laughs> and third, we had to quote our Communist Party Congresses. And I had a really big problem <laughs> justifying what I want to write about on the basis of this quote. So I was sitting in my room saying, what is it that the Party Congress has said nothing about? It was the environment. So that is how I became an environmental economist. <laughs> uh, and uh, many years later, um, I was at MIT as a Fulbright scholar. Somebody who knew me uh, and worked for the World Bank called me and said, would you like to come and give a, a talk at the bank? Uh, to me at that time, that was this mysterious, huge institution I was a bit intimidated, but I put my best jacket, I still remember it, dark brown with flowers. I walked into the World Bank, looked around, walked out and bought a dark blue suit. <laughs> so I can fit. The bank I joined in 92 is very different from the institution I am very proud to be serving today. The bank in 92 was, uh, much more homogeneous in thinking. It was highly centralized. M majority of the staff of the bank was based in uh, Washington. It was primarily run by very smart people, mostly macroeconomists. And uh, it was not quite yet coming out of, of, of deserved criticism for programs it supported called adjustment lending. So how many of you have heard about adjustment lending? Okay. What do you think of it? <laughs> I'm not seeing any signs. What do you think of it? Positive, negative? You don't know? Yeah, it's actually exactly that. Um, there, were, there were good things done, but there were also problems. And, and most of the problems come, came from the fact that uh, they were developed by people who had very little connection to the people in the countries uh, we served because we were so centralized. We were very fortunate to have as a, a president uh, for 10 years, Jim Wolfenson, who has brought the World Bank into what it is today. A vibrant institution, very diverse, where there is place for the microeconomists, but also for anthropologists, for sociologists, for people working with civil society, for people from humble beginning that are not necessarily graduates from uh, Ivy uh, Leaf uh, universities. And most importantly, this is an institution that has uh, offices in uh, 100 and almost 140 countries. It is very much grounded in what is happening in these countries 
and is able to translate this grounding in local conditions into a transmission line of knowledge that we take to all countries to benefit from. What I want to talk uh, to you uh, tonight uh, is uh, exactly what gives me sleepless nights. And it is, how can my institution do its utmost best so there are no people left out or left behind? And we can have a world that is fairer to everybody. What can we do for our small planet so it can be home for future generations as it is home for us today? We actually started this concentration on poverty in the 70s. Uh, and it was President McNamara who in 73 gave a speech in Nairobi and he talked about absolute poverty being not only bad for the people who are falling in that category, but it is bad for the world because it creates instability by its very existence. And since then that has become an organizing mission for the World Bank. Jim Wolfenson sharpened the focus on the bank on that mission. And for as long as I live, you touch me in the middle of the night and I would tell you why the World Bank exists. To fight poverty with passion and professionalism for lasting results. Seven words. So what does that mean in today's world? Well, the world we live in certainly has become much richer. It is a staggering $78 trillion GDP we produce every year. It is a world where technology is making the impossible possible. Um, I, I recently read the, that medicine uh, is so advanced that uh, many of you, the younger people in this room, are going to be living to be somewhere around 120 to 160, which sounds great, until you realize that you have to work until you are 100 for the pension. <laughs> but technology, on a serious note, it is changing the way we work and we, we, and we live dramatically. But in this richer, techno technologically very advanced world of ours, we also have to recognize that we face much more <coughs> dramatic shocks and risks. And they are in a much more intertwined manner, affecting especially the most vulnerable people and countries. They are shocks caused by the evil of men, Wars, unfortunately, have spread wider in the last decades. We have more conflicts and more people affected by conflicts today. There are shocks caused by Mother Nature. Yes, there are people who still don't believe climate change is for real and that it is human-induced. You know, everybody has the right of an opinion. But the evidence is uh, so very obvious that we have Weather events that are more dramatic, they're more frequent, they're more severe. And unfortunately, the poorer countries and the poorer people are at highest risk of these events. You just look at what happens uh, when a hurricane hits. Uh, who is most dramatically affected? Who is not insured? These are the poorer uh, communities and people. We have pandemics that, with our concentration of people, our, our high de uh, density, are a very serious and dramatic risk. We saw how the Ebola crisis can shaken up, uh, shake up the whole world. And we are much more interdependent. Our economies are mo more interdependent than, than, than ever before. So we are faced with more shocks. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we are, as a world, uh, more tempted 
to find ways to hide behind our own borders from these shocks. Uh, we, when I was in Europe, uh, you mentioned that I run the, the uh, budget and, uh, and the, the finances of the European Commission. One thing I can tell you is that uh, when there is instability, when it is com compounded, it is like a slow moving tsunami. And we saw it in Europe, we had a crisis in Syria primarily, but also in the Sahel, in the Horn of Africa. Europe for a long time thought, well, not our problem, it is somebody else's problem, until a refugee wave of over a million people within 18 months hit Europe, and Europe is now much more awake uh, than it was then. So when we look at the world we live uh, in, we ought to be optimistic for our collective capacity to deal with very dramatic problems. Take that problem of poverty we started from. Uh, anybody here born in 1996? Uh, okay. In 1996, there were 1.7 billion extremely poor people on this planet. At that time, that was 30% of the world's population of 5.7 billion. How many do we have today? Eight billion and 40% poor. We have uh, uh, 7.6 billion people and uh, uh, around less than 10% are extremely poor. We have dramatically shrunk poverty everywhere, including in the developing world. The, uh, actually, the last time we, count, we, we uh, uh, counted uh, extreme poverty uh, was in 2013, and there were 800 million poor people. Uh, those who are projecting believe that the numbers are actually somewhere around 635 million today. And this is a tremendous achievement. But, somebody before we started uh, uh, told me that you have very good statistics uh, course here in, uh, in Colby. Who studies statistics? Okay, well, <laughs> teaches maybe as well. <laughs> so you were very praised if you are teaching that course of statistics. My, my, uh, my, my, uh, my own professor of statistics used to say that uh, um, we have to be extremely careful with averages because you can put your head in the refrigerator, your feet in the oven, your temperature is average, but you are dead. <laughs> and my, my, my point is that when we, when we look at this uh, average drop of extreme poverty, we have to recognize that if you are one of these people that are living in extreme poverty, this average progress means nothing uh, to you. And I want to start from what is most concerning for us in the bank. The places where extreme poverty is going in the wrong direction. It is not going down, it is going up. Where are these places? Well, we have 12 countries where the share of people in extreme poverty has jumped, and in some of them, very significantly. My, uh, 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 very hard to say which, which country holds the record of, of most dramatic increase in uh, extreme poverty. I would think that probably it is between South Sudan and Syria. Uh, in South Sudan, extreme poverty in the last, only in the last three years went up from 45% of the population to 71% of the population. In Syria, we estimate that around 60 to 65% of the Syrian people live in extreme poverty. This is a country that seven years ago was middle income country, and it had a fairly low percentage, way under 20% uh, share of extreme poverty. So when you look at those countries where extreme poverty is jumping dramatically, the most uh, uh, 
significant reason wars. We also have countries where the share of extreme poverty is kind of stable, <coughs> maybe even going down a little bit, but the absolute number of people living in extreme poverty is going up. And I'm thinking of Niger, Chad. What is there around 18 countries in that category? What is most common? They also suffer uh, uh, conflicts. They are impacted by, very often by uh, climate uh, uh, variability, by, by climate disasters. But they also are places where population growth is very fast. So if you take Niger, you have a country that has economic growth of 3%, 3%, 2 3%, around that, that level a year, and it has population growth of 3.3%. Uh, what is the result? We have a situation in which you climb, but the numbers of people climb faster, and extreme poverty goes up. The, so we have first factor of, of conflict, second, second climate disasters, third population growth, and there is one that we, are, we all have to stare in the face, and it is bad governance. There is no reason whatsoever for Zimbabwe to be poor. It is endowed by nature, a country that is rich by nature. No reason Central African Republic to be poor. But on top of the other factors uh, that I described, and, and this particularly applies to Zimbabwe, very bad governance that actually takes away opportunities from people. So when we are talking about our fight against extreme poverty, for us at the bank, the most dramatic <coughs> place to fight it are the countries where the trend is going in the wrong direction. It doesn't mean that we are not worried about what is happening in the rest of the world. And what is happening in the rest of the world is that Yes, many countries are doing well, but almost two-thirds of the developing world objectively is faced with increased inequalities. So we are getting better off, but the accordion of who benefits and who doesn't opens up and opens up quite wildly. And when we talk about inequality, very often we concentrate on one dimension of inequality, income inequality. We look at Gini coefficient, and we look at countries where Gini coefficient uh, is, uh, is actually increasing. Um, it is uh, not just in the developing world. In the European Union, for example, during the years of crisis, what we have seen is that the south of Europe has become more unequal. My country, Bulgaria, during the crisis, the economic crisis, saw Gini coefficient going up. Many countries in the northern part of Europe actually saw the exact opposite. Income differentiation shrunk. They became more, more they, they experienced more solidarity during the crisis. Uh, the countries that did that, Germany, the Nordics, countries that have a strong tradition of getting more united at the time of difficulty. And actually that same applies for the, for the developing world. But much more dramatic is what the, the distance that is being built in terms of inequality of opportunities. And that is exactly what our report on fair progress concentrates on. Uh, and in that report, we look into opportunities for generations and how they compare, how they stack against each other. Uh, just uh, to, to take my, my own country as an example, my generation did better than the generation of my parents my parents' generation did better than the generation of, of their parents. Uh, and of course, we would like that to be the future. But 
it is not quite so. In our report, uh, we, fight, we, we, we talk about, uh, uh, for example, educational opportunities in Africa. In some countries in Africa, only 12% of people have better education than the generation of their parents. Whereas in, in Asia, in dynamic Asia, 80% have better education than the, than, than the education of their parents. This tremendous diversity of opportunities is something that we should worry about because it would translate into instability in the countries that are affected and in the world as a whole. Another element of, of inequality is gender inequality. Okay, so we publish every year a report, uh, sorry, every two years, a report that is called Women, Business and the Law. And we look at where women are across the, across the globe. To my surprise, uh, discrimination is so pervasive. It is in 134 countries of those we, 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 we sample. There are laws that in one way or another put women on a softer footing. In uh, this report, we also look at measures that are being taken and we find out that, of course, equal, equal access to education, ability of girls to go to school, to graduate and find jobs, equal opportunity in terms of access to finance, this is what makes a difference. Uh, when it comes down to gender equality, uh, this is one of the areas in which the World Bank has changed quite dramatically. The bank I joined had very few women, far between and none in senior management. The bank I belong to, last week we reached parity at the senior ranks of, of the institution, vice presidents and above. We have as many men and women. And we, we are absolutely determined to get to gender equality down the technical stream of the bank as well. Why? Because we go around the world and we talk about gender equality as good economics, and it is. The studies are very clear. Uh, the most impressive one is uh, done on how much global GDP would increase if we wake up with men and women being equal. And it is staggering. It is between 12 and 28 trillion dollars. If we were to wake up tomorrow, we would be potentially one third richer world should men and women are in equal standing everywhere. And last but not least, when we look at, at uh, inequalities, of course we look at in inequalities that are related to, to race, to sexual or orientation, to the things that in many developed countries are now more or less in the open and discussed and progress is being made. And we find that in many of the countries we work in, this is still an incredibly diff difficult terrain uh, to pursue. So what does that mean for us at the World Bank? What do we do? So we have these big problems. They are, they are, they are uh, obviously on the way of eliminating extreme poverty in the world. What we do, I will group it in, in four uh, buckets. The first and very important one for us is uh, to invest in peace and security. We used to be a bank that waits for a war to end. And when the war is over, we will come and rebuild. And it is very clear that this may have been a good strategy after the Second World War, but with conflicts now being protracted, with crises being long-lasting, we cannot sit on the sideline and wait. We have adopted a very uh, proactive engagement in fragile states. We are there and we stay there. We were in Mosul before Mosul was entirely liberated to start rebuilding the roads and the bridges so communities can come back home. We are in Kabul, we are in Afghanistan, we actually have a very 
proud achievement in, in Afghanistan when we started working there 15 years ago, there were only 1 million children in schools and 90%, more than 90% were boys. Today we have 8 million children in school and nearly 40% are girls. And I'm full of admiration for this boys and girls, and especially the girls. Some of them put their lives at risk just to go to school, but they, they go to school and they want to have this opportunity. We are very actively uh, engaged in countries that are poor and affected by, by conflicts, uh, like Chad and Sahel that I, that I, uh, in the Sahel that I mentioned, uh, or the Horn of Africa. I will give you two examples, they're very interesting examples. One is Somalia. Uh, Somalia has been a very uh, dramatically affected uh, by, by 20 years of conflict country. They don't pay their old loans to the World Bank. So we are kind of prohibited to work in Somalia. And we said, oh, come on, that makes no sense. They're finally having some progress. They have government that is more trusted by their own people. So we have found a way to engage in Somalia. We are actually building the coalition to try to get Somalia's opportunity to turn into, into, into reality. And of course, this means we have people who work there. The second one is Libya. Uh, Libya, Libya is very dramatically uh, affected by, uh, after the collapse, collapse of uh, uh, Gaddafi. Again, we didn't work there, but we cannot sit and wait for Libya to be uh, put back together. We have to be part of that process. Uh, so we just reopened our, our office in, uh, in Tripoli. Um, we opened it and right the day we opened it, there was an explosion next to it. But these are the risks we ought to take. We have committed to double funding in fragile states and we are right on target uh, to do so. Secondly, invest in climate action. I cannot think of a better task for the World Bank because of this transmission line local to global to address mitigation to help countries apply successful strategies to reduce their own footprint, but most importantly, to help countries adapt. We all have to do it, even here in Maine. I don't know whether you guys have a resilience program, and if you don't, you must. And maybe Colby College, uh, can, can, you have a great environmental program here. You can lead on that. But for us, this is paramount. There is no way we would win the war against poverty unless we help countries adapt to a changing climate. If we don't do that, in, in uh, 10 years, we would have additional 100 million very poor people pushed into poverty by climate uh, change. The third thing we do is invest in people. So here is a great story for those who, who like uh, economics and numbers. We have been assessing the wealth of nations for many years. This year, we decided to calculate the wealth of nations taking into account human capital. So we measure physical capital, natural capital, sort of institutions, and this time we calculated the share of human capital. How big do you think this share is, if you are to make a guess? The share of human capital in the wealth of nations. Just give me a number. 40%. 60%. Very close. Basically, two thirds. Two thirds. And that's incredible. And of course, what we found is that the richer the country, the higher the share. A rich country, 80%. A poor country, less than 40%. So our conclusion uh, is that it is absolutely paramount in a fast changing world to invest in skills and ad adaptive, ad adaptability. We talked about investing in kids when they are born all the way through the human cycle, making sure that we have people who are able to take jobs that don't exist. Uh, we did a study for the European Union recently. We found out that in the last five years, the EU has lost 15% low-skilled jobs. They disappeared and they have gained 15% new skill jobs. 
And on the face of it, you can say, you know, statistically, what's their problem? 15% gone, 50% new. Problem is that the guys that lost their jobs are not the guys that, are, that have the skills for the new jobs. And you see this problem here in the United States. Uh, it is everywhere. So that kind of investing in the, uh, in the capacity of, of developing countries to catch up with new technology is absolutely essential. And investing in their entrepreneurial capabilities, invest linking what is happening in the public sector with what is happening in the private sector. How we can get more women that have access to digital financial resource so they can be entrepreneurs. Last but not least, investing in institutions and the right of citizens to have their voices heard. This is the problem in the bank that is uh, dearest to my heart. Why? Because as an institution, we have evolved to turn into this place that actually can give ordinary people, the poorest of the poor, access to the high corridors of power. And that is the kind of, uh, of job that I take uh, very much uh, to, to heart. Uh, let, me, let me finish. I started with my, my personal story. Let me finish with my personal story. Uh, when I, I was growing up on the other side of the Iron Curtain, there was no way I would believe that, that one day I would be uh, zigzagging continents. But here I am. I changed systems. I changed continents I work on five times. And I changed professions more times than I want to count. So my conclusion is very simple. Change is unstoppable. And if we are to be serving especially the poor people, the poor countries, it is absolutely paramount to build that capacity to anticipate, adapt, and benefit from change. And uh, with this, I thank you all very much. <laughs> very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Georgieva, for a very inspiring talk, and thank you very much for the shout out to statistics and <laughs> its importance to guiding policy. Um, but I'm also, besides a statistics teacher, I'm also a uh, trade economist, and um, I was wondering if you could speak maybe a little bit to the um, importance of a free and open trading system in fighting poverty. Um, obviously, um, that's been a bit uh, under attack uh, lately, but uh, maybe also the um, challenges of uh, open trading system for fighting uh, poverty further. Yep. Should I take them one way? Okay. Uh, it is uh, very, very simple, very straightforward. Trade is good for growth, good for jobs, and good for fighting poverty. Trade also benefits the low income households in developed countries relatively speaking, more. So if we want to see prosperity, we have to make sure that there is division of labor among countries, that countries do more of what they do most effectively. That's the foundation of trade. It has to be fair. We have to recognize that over the last years, Success is related to comprehensive and deep trade agreements. When there are gaps, they c these gaps create problems. Right now, the most sensitive issue, in my view, is uh, intellectual property and the importance of protecting intellectual property in a way that doesn't stop 
the ability to interact among countries, in other words, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't affect negatively trade. It is a very difficult uh, issue, we have, to, we have to admit it. I certainly I was encouraged to see that uh, during the spring meetings of the bank and the fund, in private conversations and in public, there was a kind of toning down of any uh, trade war talk. People try to, especially the two large countries, China and the United States, they try to kind of ratchet down the rhetoric on that because obviously nobody wins a trade war. Are we worried about the rise of protectionism? Of course we worry. It is not yet at the point when the evidence says we are in a very bad place. Uh, this year, growth is 3.9%. Economic growth is 3.9%. Trade is 4.6%. So it outpaces, as it should, uh, growth and is one of the drivers of growth. So we have more investments, but we also have more trade. Uh, so if we are to protect it, it can only be done if we, uh, we clearly identify where the thorny spots are and there is conversation. Uh, and in that sense, uh, the visit of uh, uh, Secretary Minuchin in China, most welcome. So you have a very ambitious um, plan for the next 12 years. Is there sufficient funding to meet all those needs? Or the this World Bank? A, this is a great question. Uh, <laughs> the uh, first part of the question is that uh, the World Bank has received an incredible uh, vote of confidence by our shareholders during the spring meetings. We got a very massive capital increase. Uh, for the, uh, it is 62 billion of which 13 billion paid in capital. Uh, 7.5 billion paid in for the uh, public sector arm of the World Bank, the one I'm in charge of, and uh, 5.5 billion for our private sector arm. So what we see is a recognition that if we have that ambition for 2030, there has to be more funding to underpin it. And uh, I can tell you that in this geopolitical environment that is quite complex, I haven't talked much about it, but we all uh, know that the world is uh, much more uh, diverse in terms of interest and in how they are presented today. The fact that we got 189 countries to unite, to lift up the financial capacity of the bank, uh, I take it with, with gratitude, uh, but I also take it as a signal that there is a recognition more money is necessary. Is this enough? Not even remotely, because <laughs> To meet the, uh, the sustainable development goals, we need four trillion dollars. So we get, we now can uh, produce a hundred billion a year. So we would get one trillion from the World Bank. Not enough. What do we do? What we learned is that it is not what we directly fund. It is creating the conditions for domestic and private and, and foreign private sector mobilization that makes a difference. And so our programs today are, we call this cascade. They're, they're geared towards cascading down or up our money to eliminating the obstacles for private investments to take place and expanding the financial flows in the developing uh, world faster than it would have been uh, without without us. And uh, yeah, if you if people here want to raise your voices and say there has to be more more financing for the good of all of us, uh, please do. We <laughs> did not say no. Um, so well, first off, thank you so much for coming and speaking about your experiences with the World Bank. I know I've already learned so much. Um, I was wondering, you spoke a little bit about the different factors that contribute to inequality all over the world. 
Um, and I'm curious how the World Bank addresses the legacies of colonialism or kind of ongoing forms of exploitation in the Global South, five countries in the Global North, um, and what the bank does in that regard. We, we, we are a, a development organization and our duty is to get more resources to go where they're, they're, they're most needed. And to do so, what we put forward is the analytics, why is this necessary, but also the argument, what is in for you, whether you're in, in a developing country or a developed country. Why would people, why should people in the richer world worry about poverty uh, elsewhere? We also look into the divergence of interests. Obviously, as you said, the, uh, the uh, developing world for many years, many of the countries have been source of wealth for the richer world. And this is why it is only fair for the better of countries to share their well-being with the developing world. And we do a lot of advocacy on behalf of poor countries. For example, under the Paris Agreement <coughs> on climate, there is a commitment to provide by 2020 hundred billion dollars a year to help developing countries cope. And we are relentlessly pushing for recognition of this commitment, and clarity, where is the money? So we can, we, we can actually get that promise to be fulfilled. Because if it is not, this is a huge erosion of trust <coughs> in a world that certainly has deficit of trust to begin with. But I want to finish with what I said before. We are a cooperative. We are owned by 189 countries. In our article of agreements, it is written that we cannot be engaged in political activities, that we have to concentrate on our, on our mandate. So we do that using what we know best, and it is analysis, evidence, make the case. Uh, it would be fair to conclude by saying that you can take a horse to water, you cannot make the horse drink. And occasionally, our horses refuse to drink. Um, I was just wondering how the World Bank navigates um, the actual distribution of funds and dealing with potentially corrupt governments. Um, so you mentioned like strengthening institutions, but how would you work with um, like figuring out if those institutions were actually using the funds for what you wanted them to be used for? Right. This is this is a a. a uh, front and center issue uh, at the bank. And I was talking uh, with uh, those we were sitting at the dinner table exactly about, it, about this issue. So what we do is, uh, let, me, let me first start from the premise that I don't know a single country, any place where everybody is corrupt. So corruption may be very pervasive, but it doesn't mean that you cannot build programs where you can reach out to people and achieve development objectives. And I'll give you my favorite example because it was part of my work in the late 90s, uh, Indonesia. Uh, late 90s, very corrupt environment, but also a tremendously uh, difficult time for the uh, people in, in Indonesia because of the East Asia crisis. So here we are at the bank. We want to help communities, but we do not want to put our money in the hands of corrupt uh, authorities. So at that time, we developed a program. It is called Ketchum Atom Development Program. That was the following. We will provide block grants directly 
two communities. The, a, a community in Indonesia is called Kecamatan, the, the smallest uh, uh, local authority, against three requirements. One, that the community has to come together and agree what are their priorities. Do they need a road? Do they need a school? Uh, do they need a health clinic? Two, it would be very clear who is responsible for the money to be spent. And in the middle of the, of the village, there would be a big whiteboard. And we would write on this whiteboard how much money, what for, who is responsible. And three, we would have young boys on, on uh, motorcycles. They would be riding all over Indonesia and checking one thing. Is the board there and is the information correct? And the community would supervise. Money was not lost. So you have to find whatever. In this particular case, we went around the government. We have cases when we work with parts of the government where we have the trust that there are systems that we can control, that there is clarity of, of information, there is transparency, and we can check. And we, of course, spend quite a lot of uh, attention in supervision. But most importantly, we built this voice of citizens. And that in Indonesia, if you look at Indonesia today, I'm not saying it is not corrupt at all, it is a very different country. It has much more institutional capacity, and of course, it has translated into uh, economic growth, into investments, into a better, better environment. There are rare cases when we would stop financing because of corruption, pervasive corruption, we can't, can't deal with it, rare. In most cases, even in very difficult conditions, we would work out an arrangement that would allow us to help the most vulnerable people. And I can tell you, new technologies are incredibly helpful. We give uh, ability to people to text. So, and it's massive, like, in Pakistan, we have a program uh, to get girls and boys, but especially girls in school. All very good, but the teachers don't come. And when they come, they don't teach. So we created an app, we give it to, to the kids and to their parents. Uh, they just text, is the teacher there? Is the teacher teaching? Guess what? <laughs> Attendance of teachers jumped uh, from, I think it was 53% to almost 90% over a couple of months, just by giving that accountability instrument. And of course, what applies to teachers going to do their job uh, across the board when you give people a chance to, be, to, be, to take, take responsibility, they do it. They do it. And every so often, every so often, there are people who actually lose power because they have done bad things and they have been exposed. Uh, by the way, I, uh, uh, I apologize. Just to go back, what we actually do most systematically is to assess governance and institutional performance and then rank countries. And that plays a very powerful role in countries striving to kind of improve their performance. I've seen over the years quite a few things going from Greece to Brexit to trans Pacific Partnership Treaty, and I'm wondering, faced with all these different things, mm -hmm. how much of your leverage is in investments, how much is in persuasion, how much is in maybe something else? What, what really um, do, you, do you do for leverage in, in, when you have some of these crazy things going on? Well, I mean, we, we, we have to, we have to uh, admit that uh, the reason we have these crazy things, uh, Brexit, uh, for example, I, I lived through Brexit. I, I was uh, uh, with the European Commission when the uh, British people voted. And I'll tell you, it, this is one of the worst nights in my life, uh, following the, uh, uh, the, the vote. We have to admit that we have been uh, blind to the... Uh, to the fact that 
this accordion of opportunities has offered too loudly. If you look at the people who voted to leave the, the EU, who are they? They are low skill, mostly rural, elderly, less educated. Who voted to stay in the EU? The younger, more mobile, more urban, better educated. So it is on our consciousness that we have not paid more attention to people who feel excluded. And if we don't pay more attention to people that are excluded, there will be more nationalism, more populism, more alienation from the political uh, class. What we do at the bank is to work the evidence of exclusion to make inequality visible for the naked eye to see and to push for policies that very strongly emphasize opportunity to put, to put a lot of emphasis on governments investing in their people, investing in not only in their skills and, and capabilities and access to, to resources, uh, but also in their social skills, ability, their, their social, the social cohesion. That was something that was neglected, and we all see what the uh, impact is. Um, I, I, I will tell you that uh, when I went to Russia, I was country director for the Russian Federation in the early uh, 2000s. What I saw there was uh, men, Russian men, dying early, uh, dying from alcohol alcoholism, from suicide, from depression, and the uh, life expectancy of men shrank to 14 years shorter than life expectancy of women. Why did that happen? Because the Russian men were humiliated. Their dignity was stripped from them during the 90s. And we were blind to that, blind to that exclusion. Every time we have this blindness, every time we do it, there is consequence. And all I can say for, on, on behalf of my, of, of my institution is that we take that, I mean, this is why I try to talk more about this aspect of our work than, than maybe about trade. I, and I should have mentioned that you're right, that was a very good uh, question. Because if we are, if there, is, if, if, if there is that sense of alienation, especially alienation across generations, I mean, I, I look at the young people here, I, I do hope that you guys actually are going to be a very responsible generation. We kind of bet on you. <laughs> if we don't, if we don't have that uh, honesty, rigor of assessing what is going on in our societies, we can't deal with with, uh, with these problems. What do you think World Bank could do to address issues of countries that are highly indebted mm -hmm. and to make sure that those countries have enough resources to invest in their populations? Uh, excellent question, excellent question. During the spring meetings, uh, we had a uh, closed doors lunch with our governors and we always pick up a topic and this time we picked up that as the topic of concentration. Why? Because after 10 years of very low interest rates, what we have seen is very dangerous increase of debt levels everywhere. The world today carries on its back $164 trillion debt, mostly corporate debt, two-thirds is corporate debt, one-third is, is public uh, sector debt. In the developing world, where countries are more vulnerable to external shocks, as interest rates are starting to go up 
and you know the projections for inflation and for interest rates in the United States, the debt burden very quickly becomes impossible to bear. And what we see in the poor countries is that over the last four years, the debt to GDP ratio has <coughs> jumped from 43% to 55%. That is a very big jump in a short period of time. And most of this debt, to be exact, two thirds of this debt is not the traditional lenders, the so-called Paris Club, if, if you know that terminology. Two thirds is non-traditional donors, mostly China, <coughs> but others, and commercial debt that comes from the search for high yield. So kind of greediness. And uh, for some of our countries, uh, uh, this is becoming a real problem. So what do we do? We have started working with, with, uh, with the countries that are at highest risk to get them to be more transparent about their debt levels so we can understand what it is and then to try to work out a pathway to, to uh, uh, debt uh, sustainability. But, uh, but you're asking a very important question and it is something that is uh, in the next couple of years we will have to sort out. <coughs> We take two actions right now. One is to try to bring the non-Paris Club debtors, creditors, sorry, into the into the uh, 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 pent, if you wish. But also, we are reaching out to commercial, to fin financiers, saying, "Look at the data. Do not, do not push a wet." spaghetti on these countries. <laughs> That's an interesting image to end on. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Georgieva's lecture came about because one of our former trustees at Colby, uh, Ambassador Bob Gelbart, said, you have to hear her. She is brilliant. She is brilliant. He is right. <laughs> and, uh, not too kind, not too kind. And I hope you all feel that in the spirit of Senator Mitchell, that this is a woman who is out there changing the world, and I hope you leave inspired to do the same. So thank you for being here. We have a reception outside if you'd like to in, um, add a few more questions there or just, just chat. But thank you for being here, and good luck in the law school.